major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler, and Arlene is here. Hello, Arlene. Okay, um, you're listening to the Ableton on Air on Orca Media, www.orcamedia.net, um, and also you uh, you are listening to the Ableton on Air podcast only on Anchor and on Anchor FM and Spotify. On this edition, we are going to be speaking. Um, this whole weekend and this whole past week has just been extremely bad for the city of New York and um, the whole world. Um, there's gun violence is really taking hold of um, the situation. Um, so we are going to be speaking about uh, uh, gun violence and people with disabilities. Unfortunately, our guest is unable to make it today because I tried to reach them and they're unable um, to uh, make it. So we are uh, going to be speaking about gun violence, gun violence and people with special needs. Uh, anything you want to say about that, Arlene, before we get into our... Um, I, think, <coughs> I think guns get, get into the hands of the wrong people. Yeah. Um, now, there are laws, I'm going to look it up here, uh, next time I'll be able to bring the computer. But I'm, I'm going to look it up while we um, talk, and we... <clears throat> and I think that uh, Commissioner Shea is to blame, and the mayor. He should have shaked up the, the, the police commissioner. Why don't you shake up your police commissioner? Okay, so basically, basically there are laws uh, uh, and people with disabilities with guns. So, uh, so let's... Um, Look those up. And firearms, um, which is a big, big problem in the United States today. Um, the 1968 Gun Control Act prohibits convicted felons and certain other persons from possessing or receiving firearms, but they may petition the BATF, uh, which is... Um, a group for to get firearms um, for relief from these disabil uh, disabilities. Anyone whose application is de is denied may seek judicial review in the review court. Um, law number USC S nine two five. Basically, um, there is a federal law, but if you um, Acquiring or having or carrying a firearm, any firearm or dangerous ordinance is dangerous. Um, while, the, while the person is a fugitive from justice or while under indictment of a violent drug, felony or drug alcohol dependent problem or has been adjudicated mentally incompetent. There are states that if you are mentally incompetent, um, by the way, I'll give, um, by the way, we are sponsored, um, the um, uh, Ableton On Air is sponsored by Washington County Mental Health, and you can reach them if you need help um, through Washington County Mental Health Services. You can reach them at www.wcmhs. Dot org, but um, if you have a weapon and are disabled, um, 
I know Vermont is. Um, I know I know Vermont is an open carry state. Vermont is an open carry state, but um, there are s- serious repercussions of having a firearm. Um, in the coming weeks we, or coming months, we will uh, try to get um, chief um, of the chief of Montpelier Police Department. Uh, Pete, uh, his name is Pete, but uh, to explain that more. But um, there are serious repercussions for having a firearm. Sometime back last year, as a matter of fact, um, August of last year, uh, Mark Johnson, who lived in Montpelier, um, was shot by a uh, by a police officer um, for having a gun in his possession, and um, the whole. East side of Montpelier was, um, it looked like the SWAT team. But um, I think if you uh, have a firearm and you're disabled, you shouldn't have one. There, there, there is a law uh, with that. Anything you want to say in reference to that, um, Arlene? What? Anything you want to say in reference to being disabled and having a firearm? Well, you shouldn't have a firearm and disabled shouldn't have one because in these mental these mental cases, these mental people have mental problems shouldn't have it never. They should never carry one of these mental people because they they could shoot, they could act like crazy people. Well, we shouldn't say crazy. There's different laws, um mental mental challenge people. They shouldn't have it. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't have a carry gun never and I think that the, um, that um, that people check your time, check your time, check your time. Go to the congressman or somebody or the senator to to prevent these people from carrying firearms. Okay, so let's go over here. According to this, a uh, a law under the Cornell Law School, right? Um, Section 27 CRFS 478-114, Relief from Disabilities Under the Act. Um, Any person who makes an application or relief from disabilities under the Act for a firearm um, um, it says here um, An application for such relief shall be filed in triplicate um, with the director. But then it goes down here. um, In case of an application under the indictment, um, you you actually can go to um, a mental institution. It says if you're considered, um, number five here, in, in case of an applicant who has been adjudicated a mental, uh, mentally defective or committed to a mental institution, a copy of the order uh, should go to the court. In other words, um, if you have been in a mental institution or anything like that, you cannot own a gun. Um, I mean, in, in the fact of New York this weekend, um, 40 people, uh, 30 people died by gunshot just on the weekend. And then in the last 48 to 72 hours, it jumped to 75. So what, um, the NRA, in my my journalistic opinion, should be, um, uh oh, that's our guest. Let's um, go to him. Hi, Kenny. Larry, I'm so sorry I missed it. I'm okay, hold on. Hold on. Can you do it? Can you do it? When? What time? Uh, right now. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to merge you. I'm going to merge you right now. Hold on. Hello. Uh, Kenny, are you there? Yeah. Kenny. Kenny? 
Hi. Hi, Kenny. Uh, we're on the phone with Kenny Augusto. Uh, Kenny Augusto is with uh, Senator Bailey's office of the Bronx. Uh, Kenny, my wife and I are on the phone with you. Um, let's talk. Hi, Kenny. So let's let's talk. Since we have you on the phone, um, let's talk uh, about um, the serious problem that has been going on with the Bronx and basically the world. Um, this past weekend, uh, in the past week, as a matter of fact, there's been a lot of gun violence um, with New York City. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, um, how your office is uh, dealing with this um, serious problem and how, um, you know, because I just went a little bit over the law. You know, if you're mentally challenged, you're not allowed to have a firearm. So what, uh, what is your office doing in New York City and um, how can we work together as, uh, as uh one people to stop gun violence? For over 30 years, I've been an activist in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And I work with groups like Not In My Neighborhood You Don't, their program. I work with Stop the Violence. I work with SUV in the Northeast Bronx, mm -hmm. with Bronx Rises. And, you know, and, and Barry, you know me for a long time, so, you know, I worked for several elected officials in the 17 years I've been in government. Yeah. So we lower violence by being, engaging our youth. We lower violence by by working in our communities that suffer. So like Bronx Park East Community Association, BPECA, my group, we were able to get the kids together and have them paint on roll down gates and and use art as a medium. Mm. So instead of graffiti, like what I call illegal graffiti, I mean, we're putting legal graffiti, art from the kids. The businesses like it because they get beautified. The, old, the property owners like it because their property values go up. But the kids like it and they get to engage. We give them a very big canvas and we talk about, about financial literacy. We talk about how to stop the violence. We talk about pupils to school, pupils to, to, to prison pipeline, as mm. we call it. Mm. I can't remember it. Yeah. I, yeah, I always say people because I don't remember the, <laughs> the, the students to, you know, the students in school to, to prison pipeline. Mm. To the prison pipeline. Mm. And, and we've, been, we've been active in doing that. So, like, groups like SUV, we engage our communities. We come there's another alternative. You know, everyone thinks that gangs is something that comes out organic. Gangs? People don't say, oh, I'm in a gang, I'm sorry. Yeah. They say, no, I'm in a gang. Mm. And when we want to belong to something and there's not no other alternative, we're going to belong to something. Yeah. So how do we, how do we engage our, our students? How do we engage our youth to say that violence is not the way? How do we engage with opportunities to work when someone can say, I can give you this to sell illegally and you're going to make five times your salary and forget about school? and forget about opportunity. Anybody can get a job, very few people can have opportunity. And a lot of people, especially now during COVID, I was watching the news uh, not too long ago, and you know, people were looting, especially on Fordham Road, they were stealing. Uh, um, do you think gang violence and all this violence has anything to do with COVID, or is it separate, or is it a combination of, uh, of the two? So, Larry, you know that we've been cooped up in our apartments and our houses for three months. Yeah. People, people need to come out. People need to express themselves. People need to enjoy themselves. And when you're cooped up, that's when people get cabin fever. So when you get cabin fever, you're going to express yourself in many ways. So we can't do anything. We got to do something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Could you... So talk about a little bit about the history of how you became a community activist. And I mean, if it's OK, we can also mention, well, you can mention that you're running for city council soon, whenever that is, which I think will be a, a, an, an next. And you've uh, really um, 
personified, you know, um, a person with a challenge. Despite your challenge, you've done so much for the community at large. So can you explain what you've done and, and, and how and, and who, um, and the second part of the question is, who influenced you? The big, who was your biggest influence to do what you are doing now? Okay, so my mom was a preacher, my dad was in the unions, and they were my big inspiration. So, so my teachers were my inspiration, and my mentors were my, were my inspiration. Mm -hmm. So my mother was a preacher, she had a church in Burnside, and she she marched on she vote she registered people to vote in the 60s and the 70s she was doing women's marches in the 80s she was doing anti apartheid marches mm -hmm. in the 90s she was marching against poverty <laughs> yeah, poverty poverty and food is Well, as a person, I also have disabilities. I'm dyslexic. I'm dysgraphic. I have I have uh, attention deficit disorders. I grew up on resource room. I couldn't read. I had to relearn how to read. I had to do a lot of things to help myself. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to say I'm learning disabled. I'm differently able, but that doesn't take away from us. No, it doesn't. What? So what? What would what is your platform? I mean, it's just okay to mention that you're running for city council. Uh, what, being the fact that you're a huge advocate, and a huge advocate in the field of disabilities, and working for Senator Bailey's office, what will be your biggest platform when you become a, when you win in the city council? Yeah. So, so in terms of in terms of of my platform. I just want you to understand, like you've known my you've known my work in the disability community, yeah, and disability able community. You've known my work in the community. Mm. I'm an activist first. I'm an organizer second. I'm a uh, government um, representative third, and I'm a political operative last. And I could tell you that all my life has been about the people where I live, and also. The biggest thing that we, we have to contend with is that everyone is saying, oh, COVID. We, we didn't have to have a pandemic. So President Obama was president. There was five pandemics. And, and we had Ebola. We had SARS. We had MERS. We had uh, Zika virus. We had Hanta virus. We had... Um, West Nile, we had um, N1H1, and none of them, nobody came to the United States. This president comes in, and we have COVID. We have 180,000 people, 20,000 in New York. In the Bronx, oh. number one, epicenter of the epicenter. Mm -hmm. so you cannot tell me that this just started, started up. We're 62 out of 62 counties in New York. One out of three people are in poverty in the Bronx. Okay? 20% mm. of our youth don't know if they're going to make it to C18. The number one... And 20% 20 20 of people uh, probably are, are they probably, food insecurity plays into that too as well. You know? So. Larry, we're, we're food insecure, we're housing insecure, we're, we're disability uh, assessment insecure, we're school insecure, and we're COVID insecure. Okay, we have diabetes, we have hypertension, that affects in the African American, Latino, ex communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, the disability community disproportionately. We just lost a whole bunch of elderly poor people of color to COVID because they had pre existing conditions. So we had asthma, we have hypertension, we have autism, we have everything under the rug, we have that. Okay, yeah. diabetes, obesity. Um, nutrition, food desert. Mm -hmm. I have one out of four people 
in my neighborhood live in shelter. Wow. Okay? Yeah. I have a high propensity of kids that don't go to college. Okay? Yeah. I don't want to give you a job. I want to give you an opportunity. So that's what it's all about, man. Talk about the youth, um, because I know for a while they were going to, speaking about youth, um, when I was growing up, Summer Youth Employment Program was big in my life. Um, they gave me a lot. Mine too, Larry, mine too. I was, I was, 1985, I was in the Summer Youth, and I did it for three years, so I was 18. Yeah, so 1988, 1988, I had an opportunity. I went to Mind uh, Builders Creative Arts Center, and I, I was working in a summer camp there, but I did that for about six years of my life. And um, it, it, through de Blasio's office, I know that they were saying that they were gonna cut a lot of youth programs. Uh, is there any alternatives to summer youth if there's COVID? I mean, what is the alternative this summer? Do you have anything to add so, to? Yeah. So we need, you know that summer youth is very saved in the budget, but you know that this is gonna be, this pandemic is gonna cost us dearly, okay? We mm. have we have a budget that everyone's gonna get cut. They're talking about municipal union workers are gonna be cut. These are bread and butter issues. Yeah. Everything that's happening is interrelated. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that we didn't figure out that we had comorbidity when COVID happened. We had we figured out comorbidity in the '80s, and everybody wants to help you, and everybody wants to go in the neighborhood, and they say the same things: "Come vote for me, and I'll set you free." But I don't see you out there. I don't see you working. I don't see you what you're doing. I don't see what you've done, and that's what's happening. So I, I chose to, to throw my hand in the race for city council in the Bronx, and I'm here to, to say that we're going to tackle our issue. Mm -hmm. But you can't just tackle it alone. Other people have to tackle it with you. Well, again, Larry, this is not about me. This is not, this is not about Kenny Agosto. This is about the people that live in that district, mm -hmm. in the Bronx as whole. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And we have to do everything movable to make sure that our communities go together and we're not fighting amongst each other for the club. No. I, I was at a protest yesterday. I'm, I was in a housing, I barely made it, to a housing protest because New York City Housing Authority, there's $2, two billion in debt and there's no repair. I come from the McKinney houses in the South Bronx. Mm. I have developments in my area. And what is, what's going to happen to them? COVID hit them hard as well. What are we doing about that? There's ventilation issues that are, that are not even being addressed. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everyone's behind the, the eight ball in trying to fix these developments. Okay? Yeah. I remember how I grew up in them. So these are things that, I'm, these are things that, that we're talking about. Yesterday was about banks. The banks are leaving us. I was in Birdside. And, and, and Chase is gone and Amalgamated is gone. And my, my thing that I want you to, to think about, Larry, is that in 2008, do you remember 2008? Yeah. In 2008, um, we had an economic downturn that they, they said it was the Great Recession, almost the Great Depression. President Obama almost didn't make it, and he, it could have been a depression all over again. Who saved us? President Obama and reinvestment. Now, in, in that reinvestment, Corporate America took advantage, and they said they said that my bank was too big to fail, right? Yeah. So you're a taxpayer, Larry. My friend, my friends who are with me right now are taxpayers. We bailed out Chase. We bailed out Wells Fargo. We bailed out Amalgam Amalgamated and Citibank. We, we 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 bailed out Ford. We sold out Chevron. We've done a lot of work. So now, if those companies are too big to fail, aren't we too many to ignore? We, we all rent. What is a, for, for those that don't know, what's a bailout? <laughs> so that means the taxpayers mm. and the pay, when the taxpayers are used to pay to bail out a situation, we, if we let the banks fail, they say, 
then we would have gone to where we would have gone. Mm. Mm. Anyway, uh, wow. Um, so you're a huge activist in, in the field of special needs. How, how um, besides what you're planning on doing, all right, now how long is, for a person that runs for city council, how long are they allowed to run for, two or three years? It's usually a four-year term, but because of redistricting is every, is every two years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do you plan now, uh, um, will you be the only person with a disability on city council, or has there been others in the past? I don't know the answer to that question. I probably, for the Bronx, I'll be the first, but mm. there could be someone with a disability that had been elected. But I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. I'll check it out. Mm. Anything else you want to add to what you're doing in, in uh, for what you're doing in the Bronx and beyond? <laughs> I didn't hear you. I said, anything else you would like to add to what you're doing in the Bronx and beyond? Because you're doing some extraordinary work. Thank you. Um, I just want to add that I intend to service all my communities, and I am because I am a differently abled individual. I'm going to fight for, for ours especially hard. Mm -hmm. So our, 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 our people with disabilities, whether it be development disability or learning disability or any disability, we're gonna, we need to work to empower ourselves, make sure our trains are fully able, that things are, are, are ADA compliant and that everybody gets an opportunity. That if you can't hear, you can hear the traffic lights. If you can't see, you can, you can get, get the sound to, to cross. You, things that need to be ramped apartments to be reimagined so you can shelter, grow into your shelter, grow into your... Yeah, um, a question in, in reference to that. For example, the traffic lights, you push them, they speak. Uh, down in Manhattan, they have that. How come, how come in the Bronx they don't, or some parts of the Bronx they don't? They should have that all over the place. They have it here in, in, in Vermont. They have, it, they have it by South Manor, 23rd Street. Yeah. So why is it that certain parts in the in Manhattan have that, um, but not everybody does? Is that a money thing, or is that a that can't be laziness? Is, is it is it completely money? I didn't hear. I didn't hear. I said. I didn't hear what you said. Okay, I'm gonna repeat it again. Can you hear me? Okay. So. Uh, so the situation is that some parts of Manhattan have that uh, have that traffic light where people can um, where where people can you know push the button and it speaks to you you know to cross the street. So uh, my question is, why is it that all of the city doesn't have that? I I think because the New York City is very large mm. and they may not have the budget for it, but I think this is something that we need to do. We got to equate everything for disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Kenny, I would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Abled and On Air and uh, for television and the podcast. We'd like to thank our uh, sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, um, Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, and uh, Anchor FM, and um, we would like to thank all our sponsors, and Kenny, we'd just like to thank you again for joining us on this edition of Able to On Air. Thanks again, man. Larry, I want to just say to you, you and your wife, that you, I, I've always been a fan of yours when you did Special Issues, Special People, mm -hmm. and... And I want to, I, I want to know I, that I know that New York's loss is Vermont's game, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna follow you wherever you go, and we're gonna pod together. And anytime you need me to be on your show, it's my pleasure. Okay. All right. So, say say hello. See you, and a big shout out to Alice and my other Vermont crew, and Alan and and everyone. So I love you guys both. Peace uh, out, and don't forget, however you do it, vote. Vote, vote. Mm. Uh, say hi to Senator Bailey for, for us, huh? I will. Thank you. 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 Thank
I will, man. Thank you. No problem. Take care. Love you guys. Be good. All right. Thanks. Yeah. This puts an end to this edition of A Book on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Arlene Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Allah Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info Associated Press Media Editors U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International Anchor FM and Spotify